So let's look at the reasons for Cuba uh, declaring their independence. What is a reason that Cuba? What is one of the reasons that Cuba is um, declaring its independence? This is not a rhetorical question. I know the answer, and so should you, because we just talked about it two days ago. It's not Thursday night. So there's no reason that those brain cells that house that information we talked about two days ago are dead yet. Tomorrow, different issue. But okay tonight. Okay, their economy crashed because of all the crazy tariffs which, you know, we went through. What else? Just a whole bunch of abuses. Uh, Spain responds by sending a guy over there and he, he starts you know, treating everybody like criminals. And they rebel. Okay? Then you have uh, William Randolph Hearst and the New York Journal and, uh, and Frederick Grimmington having their epic conversation. Uh, you provide the pictures, I'll provide the war. You know, drum up support in the military uh, in, in, in the American public uh, that will eventually lead to a war. Those appeals are just as bad, and that broadcasting of information without having the facts all the time is known as yellow journalism, okay? When you think of yellow journalism today, what would be a, an example? The tabloids, U.S. News, um, U.S. Weekly World News, or something. You know, I don't even know. I, I haven't been to a Walmart in so long. But when I was in when I was in college, I worked at Walmart uh, for seven years. So from, from the time I uh, my last year in high school all the way to grad school. And so you'd have, they'd have these newspapers that had lies, you know, just blatant lies. Everybody knew they were lies, but people bought them because of an entertainment value, an entertainment factor. There. So, you know, these people, they're whipping up war support, uh, support for war against Spain because of these atrocities occurring in Cuba. What's another reason that we have a desire to go to, uh, go to war with uh, Spain over this? What, what is one of the major problems? Uh, it's not a good reason, but it is a reason that can still be claimed uh, for American people. It's another one. How much are we invested in their markets? We have $50 million invested in that amount of uh, time, in, 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 uh, that amount of money at that time period. That's equivalent today of $11 billion. It's a lot of money. Now, some things are going to happen that is going to kind of expedite the um, path to war with Spain. The first is called the DeLone Letter. The DeLone Letter is written by Enrique de Puy de Lone, who is the Spanish ambassador, uh, obviously from Spain, to the United States. He's going to write to his friend uh, a rather disparaging comment about McKinley. He is going to write to his friend that McKinley is weak, catering to the rabble, and besides, a low politician who desires to leave the door open to me and stand well with the jingos of his party. Okay? There's a word there that you don't know, and that is jingo. A jingo today would be considered a radical. Okay? The Tea Party is often portrayed as radicals in our society today because they have this crazy idea that we're taxed enough already, which is what the Tea Party, T and Tea Party stands for. All right, we're taxed enough already. We need to do better with what we have, and we should do all sorts of crazy things like, uh, you know, not spend more than we we bring in. Okay, so that would be considered a jingoist statement today. You know, we need to spend more, we need to spend less, and. Um, uh, spend less than, or spend about the same that we bring in, all right? Because we're going in debt with all these taxes that are rising up. So what he's saying here is that our president is a low politician, that he is weak, he caters to the rabble, and besides, he wants to leave a door open to me. Okay, so he's kind of boasting. So this gets picked up by the New York Journal. And you can imagine Hearst has a field day with this extra, extra Spanish minister calls our president a, a, a freaking idiot. You know, obviously, it's going to cause problems. Yeah. 
1998. It has been so far a Spanish month. Now, 1911, they go out and they do a survey on it. They actually build a coffer dam around the main, and that's basically a wall around the main, and they uh, shut out the water. Bless you. They're then able to investigate it and look at the ship. What they discover is that the blast pole that sinks the ship, that blew off the front of the ship, is outward. Okay? What does that tell you? Explosions from the inside, because if it was out in because if it was from the outside, the explosion would have gone inward, right? And it comes from the inside. Now, what they said, this 1911 study said, is that it was um, the, the United States had just switched from um, anthracite coal, which was used to power the boilers, because all our ships are steam engines at this time period, to uh, a venomous coal, which is uh, hotter and burns longer. So they put it on this uh, coal. Uh, igniting the ammunition in the hull of the ship and blowing it up. Okay, but we don't know that 1911. I mean, we know that 1911. We don't know that in 1898. The first thing say that it is a Spanish month. Now, what happens in 1911 is after they find this out, they make the ship seaworthy. They tow her out through the main out into uh, the the Caribbean, three miles, and they open her uh, sea locks, which scuttles the ship, and the ship sinks, all right? In 3,700 foot depth. No way anybody can get into it at that point. Why? Then what? Not necessarily hide the evidence. They didn't want anybody else to look at it. So what happens is they sink it. Now, we've done surveys on it from then. You know, Discovery Channel does stuff as we discovered recently. Most likely, it is a, an explosion to from inside. I mean, that's just how it is. Okay? But however, we don't know that. And this is reported luridly in all the newspapers because, hey, it bleeds, it leaves. Now, McKinley is pretty much going to have his hands tied. He doesn't want to go to war, but he pretty much has his hands tied because everybody in the United States wants to go to war. Only if other person who says, maybe this isn't a good idea, is the Speaker of the House. But both of their hands are tied. So he issues, McKinley issues, an ultimatum to Spain and says, you are going to compensate us for the loss of the name and you are going to free the Cuban people and recognize their independence. Now Spain, I've told you, is kind of backward. It really hasn't done much in, in hundreds of years. They can't respond quickly across the ocean to McKinley's demands. And things are escalating so quickly in the United States that they just don't really have a chance. Because McKinley is not getting the response that he demands, he goes to Congress and says, I would like the power to intercede militarily in Cuba. And that is granted on April 17, 1898. To which, after Congress gives him this authority, an amendment is attached, and it's called the Teller Amendment. The Teller Amendment says, after the United States is finished with Cuba, it will be an independent nation. We will not make it a colony. We will not keep it. It will not become a territory. It will not become a state. So with this power to intercede, McKinley sends a... Uh, places a blockade off the coast of Cuba preventing Spanish ships from arriving. Spain, upset at this, declares war against the United States on April 23rd. Two days later, the United States would declare war. However, we, in our declaration of war on April 25th, would say that a state of war has existed between the two nations since April 21st. Okay? That's just kind of our way of saying, yeah, we're going to one-up you. OK, 
Okay, so, back in 2002, when the United States went to war with Iraq, then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld made a very appropriate statement that he got lambasted by the media. He said, you don't go to war with the weapons you want, you go to war with the weapons you have. What does that mean? When war is thrust upon you, you go to war with what you have, not what you would like. This is in response to you know, one of the big things in the early part of the Iraqi war was these uh, roadside bombs, uh, what do they call IEDs. And what would happen is they would go underneath the, the um, Hummers that they had and they would blow them up and cause a lot of damage. It would, it would take about two, three years before we got these devices, these vehicles that were able to deflect blast from IEDs out from underneath it, armored more on the bottom. And he said, it's kind of callous, but he says, listen, go to war with what we have. That's what we have. It stinks, but you can't just say, I need this, I need this vehicle. It doesn't just happen like that. So when war comes, we are not prepared. We are not prepared. Our army is going to take a while to get ready. However, um, our Navy is probably at the highest point it's ever been at this point. Um, thanks in part to a admiral, a brilliant historian by the name of Alfred T. Mayhem. He would write this book called Dreadnought, A History of Naval Sea Power. And in this book, he would say, throughout history, the nation that has the greatest navy rules the world. You buy that? The nation has the greatest navy rules the world. Spain, in the 1500s, did they rule the world? Yeah, pretty much. And then what happens? 1588, Philip II launches the Spanish Armada, the invincible Spanish Armada against England, and what happens? The Protestant wind destroys it. Do they ever really recover? No. Who in here knows Great Britain's national anthem? Our national anthem is what? We'll say to the What is England? You've heard it. I promise you, you have heard it. Huh? What is it? What is it? You know it. Rule Britannia. Britannia rule the waves. Rule Britain. Britain rules the waves. If you rule the waves, you what? At this time period, from the French Revolution to World War One, England had the dominant navy. Okay. So what happens is he's saying... The way this works is the navy that has the best, I mean, the, the nation that has the best navy rules the world. And it's one of those things like, well, yeah, that makes sense. So what happens is it starts off this madcap venture for all the nations. It's going to lead to World War I, in which you have all these nations trying to revolutionize their navy. And the United States and the Cleveland administration jumps on that boat and says, yeah, we're going to do this. And our Navy's going to be freaking awesome. How awesome do you say? Well, let's talk about it. So we're going to war, and our goal is what? What is our goal? This is kind of funny. I have to hold on to this. Put the pin in this. We're going to war against Spain, what? To revenge the main. To what? To avenge the main. To the main, okay. But our ultimate goal is... Do what? What do we want to happen? Cuban freedom. We Cuba Libre is is the claim. You know, free Cuba. So that is our goal. Where does the first battle occur? It's not Cuba. At this time. A young man by the name of Theodore Roosevelt, who had made a name for himself as a uh, city commissioner in New York, 
of uh, of of uh, dealing with corruption, eradicating corruption in New York City. Uh, then is going to be elected to be the police commissioner of New York City. Is going to become a very uh, famous person eradicating uh, corruption in the New York City Police Department. Has now become the secretary, assistant secretary of the Navy uh, to the McKinley administration. Now, the secretary of the Navy is a very old man, and he has just married a very young wife. Needless to say, he is not going to be in the office much. Why? Other pursuits. Other pursuits. So what happens is Theodore Roosevelt is in charge of day-to-day -day operations of the Navy. And this is what occurs. When the Navy is, actually, when things are starting to look bad with uh, Spain, he wires out to the British uh the British island of Hong Kong, I think I know it's like Hong Kong, British, yes, it's a colony here, where the United States uh, Asiatic fleet is, and tells Commodore uh, George Dewey, says, hey, war is coming, be ready to go in a moment's notice. Now, today, how many of you guys have ever seen a warship? A military warship. What color are they? They're gray. They're gray. Okay, back then, you only painted them gray if you were going to war. They were painted white otherwise because those are peaceful colors. All right? So, you painted them white. So the first thing Dewey does is he starts painting his ships uh, gray. <laughs> well, if you've ever been on a naval ship, the first thing they do is they are always painting it. Because if you don't, what, what is a ship made out of? Steel. What happens to steel and salt water? It rusts. So you chip and you paint, you chip and you paint, you chip and you paint. So, no, that's, that's what they do. So he paints them, he paints them all um, gray. Now, as soon as the declaration of war comes out, he steams from Hong Kong to the Philippines. All right? So Hong Kong. Right here, and he's going to steam to the Philippines. He arrives at daybreak on May 1st, 1898. And guess what? He sails into Manila Bay where he finds the entire Spanish fleet at anchor. They don't know what we know. So he starts out 5,000 yards. Boom, 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 boom. Second pass. Third pass. Fourth pass. Five passes. Four hours the Spanish fleet is destroyed. The United States takes one casualty and the man recovers. Okay? Manila Bay is named Manila Bay because the Philippine capital. Now, by the way, the Philippines is a Spanish possession. Let me make sure you understand that. We're not just going out and attacking somebody. We're attacking a Spanish possession. So we go and we attack them. All right? Go and we attack them. And what happens? They are completely destroyed. Dewey telegraphs. To San Francisco and says, "I need army. I, I need the army to come and put down uh, the city. You know, the, you know, navy. They're safe. They have Marines on the, on board, but that's not enough to secure an entire uh, city. So the soldiers arrive, and Manila itself surrenders on August 13, 1898. I love this picture. This picture is fantastic because there's a lot of le uh, urban legends." In United States history, this is one of them. This is that when we attacked Manila Bay, uh, the, the, the found Manila Bay, when we attacked, we completely destroyed their fleet. And this was a popular painting at this time. Look, our ships are gray. They're beautiful. They got these these, these uh, scroll works done. We've got our, our uh, ensign battle flag flying. And and what? What do you see? What else do you see? 
Tom, what do you see over here? What does this look like? Okay, the sinking Spanish ship. Spencer, what is, what's different between those ships and our ships? Wow, that's pretty good. I'm throwing the voice. Good job. They're wood. They look like Spanish galleons. Okay, they look like the same type of ship that Spain had sent to defeat England in 1588. Okay, of course a steel ship is not going to face any problem from what? A wooden ship, it's not going to happen. Now, that's, that's all well and good, but guess what? It's not the truth. They were steel ships as well. All right, They were steel ships as well. It's just one of those things. kind of like when we get to World War uh, II, and there's this, you know, this kind of a joke about the, the Polish army, the Polish cavalry. Uh, they trained, they didn't have uh, money for tanks, so they trained with attacking... Their cavalry attacking tanks by putting cardboard on Model Ts. So the Model T, and somebody with a, you know, with with a uh, cavalry lance would just go and hit it and puncture the, the cardboard. And go, Yay, we won! And then of course what happens is when Germany rolls into Poland, they like, why aren't our lances working against their armor? You know, it, it didn't happen. It's a it's a, a urban legend. I like this pose and this painting too because look what else. What's going to happen right here? Fairly soon. And it's going to happen. This is real. You're not going to stop this from happening. They're going to collide. You know, you're here. Yeah, I mean, it's, not, it's not like a car you slam on the brakes, you know, or, or jerk the steering wheel or go like that. I mean, those things take quite a bit of stuff. So those, you know, especially like these crude liners, they take a couple hours just to, to turn around. Now, so, Manila Bay surrenders. Our first victory is where? All right. Our first victory comes where? Comes to Manila. Our goal is to free Cuba, but what's our first course of action? Is to go after something that has no, you know, we're not, yes, we're going to free the Cubans in the Philippines. Well, aren't those Filipinos? Yes, but we're, we're going to free them too. <laughs> Pretty sweet, right? All right, so the Navy's always ready, always ready to go. You know, that's the moment's so boom. That's just the nature of the Navy. Army, on the other hand, is different. When the war starts, we have about 2,300 officers in our army. They officers. We have 28,000 enlisted men, soldiers. By the time that the war is over, we'll have 2 million enlisted. You don't go from 2,300 office, officers and 28,000 men to all of a sudden 2 million enlisted. Now McKinley is going to issue a call for, uh, for 120,000 volunteers to fight this war. He says, everybody needs to descend on Tampa Bay because that's where we're going to leave from. Problem is, of this 120,000 men that he calls for and plans for, 200,000 show up. To make matters worse, you have enlisted army and you have... Um, you have volunteers. Theodore Roosevelt is going to resign his position as Assistant Secretary of the Navy and raise a volunteer company uh, of cavalrymen called Rough Ride, the Rough Riders. How many guys have ever been to the Manger Hotel in San Antonio? Right across from the Alamo. I was there last Thursday. Yeah? Okay, what's famous about the Manger Hotel? It's what? It is haunted, yeah. You can take a haunted uh, tour of it. But if you go into the bar, and you probably can't because you're probably not 21 yet. If you go into the bar, they have this big picture of Theodore Roosevelt. Why? Because Theodore Roosevelt recruited men to be in his Rough Riders in the Baker Hotel's bar. And that little plaque up and says, you know, this is where it, 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 he sat, things like that. And these were people that he recruited. He only took the best of the best. And they drilled at a camp outside of San Antonio. So these men descended on Tampa Bay. Now, the problem here is that the United States has not been in a war since the Civil War. 
And everybody that knew how to do things, like logistics, are gone. So what happens is you have uniforms shipped by the thousands, by train, that are forgotten in uh, on back lines of, of rail lines. You've got soldiers who can't get to the front to the front to get on the ships. You've got soldiers who can't get food. You've got soldiers who can't get rifles. The rifles haven't changed any. Technology has changed, but the rifles haven't. You've got uh, cavalry men who can't get their horses. You've got it. You've got um, you've got infantry men. We're getting ready to go into Cuba in July, and we have infantry men who are being who are being issued the same type of uniform that they wore in the Civil War. They're made out of wool. Raise your hand if you want to go to the tropics and wear long sleeve woolen uniforms. Nobody was raising their hands. The food they're provided with is probably left over from the Civil War as well. It is called embalmed beef because it is that old. It is that nasty. But yet that is what they're given for uh, their rations. Now, a major problem with the invasion is that although we are keeping by blocka the blockade people from uh, uh, Spain from resupplying Cuba, there is a Spanish flotilla, a naval, um, a, a, a naval force, a Spanish naval force, in the area. It is commanded by Admiral Cervera. The Spanish fleet must be found before we can attempt an invasion. Because we're going to take 200,000 men, supplies, troops, everything you need, and we are going to go from Tampa Bay, Florida to Cuba. About 150 miles. But the problem is, it's probably going to be about... I don't know, let's say probably about... Uh, upwards of a thousand ships to transport all of this war material to where the war is actually going to be fought. What's the problem? If you, these are unarmed freighters. If you have a fleet that is unknown and you start trying to get from point A to point B and the fleet shows up, you have a massacre on your hands. So it becomes imperative that they find this fleet. Eventually, Cervera's fleet is found. This is a picture of Theodore Roosevelt and his Rough Riders. They find his fleet in Santiago Harbor. They are at anchor. So we have Santiago right here. It's a city. And uh, Cervera's fleet is right there. We are, we put a blockade on him so he can't get out, but neither can we get in. But because his fleet is bottled up, we are able to land in Cuba at a little place called Dacre. Now, outside Santiago, there is a place. called Santiago Hills or San Juan Hill. Whoever controls San Juan Hill will control the town of Santiago and will also control Santiago Harbor. Why? Why were Dorchester Heights so important for Washington to take outside of Boston in 1775? He could shoot down into Boston Harbor and force Admiral Howe's flotilla to flee. But to stay there, they would what? They would be destroyed. So we can't get in. Our Navy can't get in. He can't get out. We're at a stalemate. We have to break the stalemate somehow. So what happens is we plan on attacking San Juan Hill because if you take San Juan Hill, 
you will be able to put cannon there that will destroy Santiago and will be able to destroy San, uh, um, uh, Severus' fleet. Now, at Dacry, they run into a problem. A lot of the things that were supposed to show up did not show up. One of the things, uh, one of the problems that uh, Theodore Roosevelt had was that he could not find a military ship to take he and his rough riders across the ocean to Cuba. So he, in order to not miss the battle, he buys a ship that he and his men are going to go over to Santiago. When he gets there, he has a slight problem with their, with their horses. Now, how many of you have ever heard the phrase, you either sink or you swim? Where does that phrase come from? It comes from how you, up, you offload a horse uh, from a ship when there's no, not a harbor, there's not a pier. What you do is you have the ships in the hull, in the hold of the ship, and you have this crane. This crane has a sling on it. They put it around the horse. The horse is picked up and swiveled over to um, the water, and it's dropped. The horse goes down, and it has two options. It either sinks or it swims. So the first horse, they drop. Whoop, doesn't come back up. Second horse. Third horse. All the horses sink, except for the last one, named Little Tex. Picks it up, drops it into the water. You might think that eventually these, they're going to be able to stand on one of the other What happens? What happens is this one pops his head up, starts swimming, out to sea. A cavalry bugler on land sees this and blows the uh, the the uh, and blows up the uh, signal for uh, to gather. You know, over here this way. The horse, being a cavalry horse, hears it, realizes it's supposed to go over there, turns around and swims to shore. At the Battle of Santiago, the Battle of San Juan Hill, this picture is very accurate. Theodore Roosevelt is on Little Tex, the only rough rider with a horse. Now, this is a very bloody battle, mainly because the United States is fighting a war with antiquated weapons. There's been a new invention that had come out and that the United States had not adopted because we had a, uh, quite a, 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 a surplus of this item. What it was, was a smokeless uh, gunpowder. Spain had it, we did not. The problem with gunpowder is gunpowder really hasn't changed any since the old musket days when you the old pop of smoke goes up. People can see you everywhere. But if you're hiding behind something and you've got a smokeless, uh, you've got some, you're using smokeless uh, gunpowder, don't see anything. This battle, the rough riders of the United States Army is going to take a lot of casualties because they can't see the people that they're shooting at. In one memorable scene, uh, a rough rider is crawling on his belly up San Juan Hill when Theodore Roosevelt rides up to him on his horse. He says, "What? Aren't you a man? Why are you, uh, why are you afraid on your belly like a worm when I am atop of a horse? Stand up and fight!" <laughs> so, the guy Shane gets up and. and uh, attack. The end of the day, San Juan Hill is taken, and because of that, we are able to put cannons that are able to bombard Cervera's fleet and also Santiago. On the first day, Cervera is going to flee, he's going to run our blockade. But it's not very difficult for us to catch up to him, and his uh, Spanish flotilla is destroyed. Santiago is going to surrender on July 17th. And then what's going to happen is Theodore Roosevelt is going to be issued the Congressional Medal of Honor, the highest award that the nation can give a soldier. It's going to be given to him. But before he gets it, 
he is going to write uh, a round robin letter. And basically, what that is, is today it would be considered like you hitting forward on a, on a junk mail, uh, or, or, or you um, retweeting something. Okay, somebody else had. And basically, what it is, it's a letter to the newspaper saying that after the battle is, has uh, has finished, uh, the army doesn't really know what to do with the men that are there. And yellow fever and malaria has set in, and those men are dying. And so the United States needs to bring these men home. But because he does it in such a public way, uh, he is not going to be issued his Medal of Honor. Now, Congress never says that's the reason. However, he says it's the reason. And in 2001, finally, Roosevelt is going to be issued his uh, Congressional Medal of Honor, and it is on display in the White House in the Roosevelt Room. So, with... What? So, with this battle, this splendid little war comes to an end. We negotiate a treaty in France, the Treaty of Paris in 1898, in which we uh, get Spain to relinquish control of Cuba. Cuba will become independent. We will be there as an occupying force until they get a provisional government set up. But we also get Puerto Rico and the uh, Philippines and Guam. For all that, I always joke that the United States just has uh, uh, checks pre-printed with the amount of $20 million on it, because it seems like whenever we give somebody something, we give them $20 million. Like, here's $20 million, go away. Quit bothering me. We give them $20 million. Mexican-American War, hey, Mexico, we kicked your rear. Here's $20 million, leave us alone. Hey, Spain, we kicked your rear. Here's $20 million, leave us alone. We give them $20 million, they leave us alone. Now, this brings us to the election of 1900. The Treaty of Paris almost failed when it's being ratified in the Senate. Remember, the House, excuse me, remember, when a treaty is being negotiated, just because some guy signs it for, that represents the United States does not mean it's legally binding. It's not legally binding until uh, the Senate approves it. And it almost fails. It almost fails because, you know, they didn't like what, what, what we did. Even then, it seems like we're smacking of, 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 of aggression there. So what happens is William Jennings Bryan convinces the Democrats to, to go ahead and ratify the Treaty of Paris. But what we'll do is we'll use this in 1900 as an election, uh, the key issue of the election, 1900 election. So what happens is that's what they do. Now, if you go to vote... Sometimes you will have a decision, be able to make a decision, a policy decision, for your state, or perhaps your county, or your city. This would be like, do you believe we should have a water district created for Brazos County? If you say you have the option of yes or no, that is a policy issue that you are allowed to decide. When that occurs, it's called a referenda. All right? If there's more than one, it's a referendum but a referendum is, what do you think about this issue? And depending on how people vote, the majority who win will have that decision made. So what Jennings says, or what Jennings Bryan says, is let's make this uh, coming election, the 1900 election, about imperialism. Should the United States be an imperial nation? Now, when you have the word imperial, what are we talking about? An empire. Should the United States have an empire? Now you're like, wait a minute, why does that even matter? Why is that a big deal? <coughs> well, it is. For us, we're used to having all of our possessions in the Pacific. We're used to having all these other things all over creation. But for them, it was new. And 125 years ago, which isn't that long, the United States had been part of an imperial system, and we hated it. 
And in 1776, what did we do? We rebelled, wrote the Declaration of Independence, and said, we do not want to be part of this imperial system. Now, 124 years later, we have our own empire. So have we become what we hated? That's the, what the issue is. The Republicans are going to renominate William McKinley for another term, and the Democrats are going to renominate William Jennings Bryan. And it's basically that key issue is should the United States have an empire? Now, you'll notice Theodore Roosevelt is made vice president. He's made vice president because after the war, he is going to take his fame and convert it into becoming the governor of New York. As you can imagine, he's going to do as governor of New York what he had done all the other times. When he was county commissioner, I mean the city commissioner of New York City, he dealt with corruption and he cleaned it up. When he dealt with, and he was police commissioner, he dealt with co uh, corruption and cleaned it up. Guess what he's going to do as New York governor when he's elected in 1899? He's going to deal with corruption at the state level and start cleaning it up. And this makes the Republicans in New York City hate him because he's infringing on their territory and they don't like him. But he's got a four-year term and he hasn't even completed the first year. And they're already begging to get rid of him, but he's too popular to impeach. So they begged the Republican National Committee in 1900, get rid of this guy for us, do something. He's killing us. So the political boss, Mark Hanna, who we talked about last time, says, all right, we'll put him where he can't do any damage, we'll make him vice president. Okay, so we'll make him vice president. So Theodore Roosevelt becomes vice president. What's the problem, Abby? It's a zero-numbered year in which a president is being elected in 1900. Therefore, we know McKinley ultimately is going to die in office. Why anybody would run in that zero number year, I don't know. So, I do realize Midway's up here twice, so uh, I'll take that out. Maybe not. No, go away. Alright. So, let's look at our holdings. Did the American people approve of us having an empire? Well, obviously, if the election is made all about yes or no, and the incumbent wins, and therefore be having an empire, What's the answer? Yes, they do. They do want us to have an empire. So, at the end of the 19th century, we have added to our uh, possession a whole chain of uh, Pacific Islands. We have Midway. We have Guam. We have Wake. We have Hawaii. And we have the Philippines. Now, if you have ever heard anything about World War II, you've probably heard about the Battle of Midway. If you've ever heard anything about World War II, you've heard about the Battle of Guam, of Wake Island. Hawaii is a little place called Pearl Harbor, and the Battle of the Philippines. At first, these are added to our possessions, not because of, as somebody said in the last class, uh, because we needed airports, planes haven't been invented yet, but because of the need for coaling refueling stations. We needed refueling stations. Why do we need refueling stations? Well, coal burns, it's not very efficient, and it has to be resupplied. You cannot go from San Francisco to uh, China without being refueled. And in order to do that, you need to have a place where you can be refueled. Now, other nations have different possessions uh, in that area where we could buy coal from them, but why don't we just buy coal for ourselves, for our Navy? So these islands are going to be areas for us to resupply. Now, why did I say we're going to China? Well, we're going to China because China is going to become a very important place. The same reason China is important then is the same reason China is important today. And our concern with China today is what? In 2014. What don't we like about China? 
Well, it's communist. Yeah, okay, that's not that's, that's good. It's not exactly where I'm going to right now. Regardless of their type of economic system, what do they compete with us for? Jobs. Jobs created idols, right? Manufactured idols. And it's no different there. They are a market for us. Now, China has been around forever. You've had all these different dynasties. They fall and new ones come up. But in 1894, something is going to happen that has not happened before. And that is going to be the first Sino-Japanese War. Sino is Chinese, all right? So what happens in this battle, in this war, Japan is going to attack China. Now, Japan had been um, a Japan had been a, a very isolationist nation for thousands of years. They did not want anything to do with anyone. And in fact, uh, if somebody was washed up on their shores, they would be executed. This would all change about in the 18, I can't remember exactly, 16, 1860s, late 60s, or early 70s, when uh, the United States sent in uh, a fleet to Japan's harbors and said, you're going to open up your markets to us, and if you don't, we're going to blow you back to Stone Age, which for them at that point was not very far. However, it was very uh, eye-opening for the Japanese because the Japanese have always believed that they are a superior race to any other race on Earth. And then for them to be confronted with a, the naval might of the United States, and they cannot compete against that, was an eye-opening event. So as a result, they would embark on a crusade to improve their military and create a modern navy. And they're going to be able to do that in just record amount of time, and they actually defeat Chinese who are much more advanced than them in this war. Now, it, basically what happens is, in this war, it reveals how weak China is, and China loses the Korean Peninsula, Peninsula to Japan. At this time, China is overseen by the Empress Dowager, which basically that means is the Empress was a young girl and had not come into power yet, but her mother, the Dowager, was the one who actually ruled in her stead. That's kind of like a regency. So, because the Empress Dowager was so <laughs> weak, European nations started carving up, uh, carving up spheres of influence. And these were dedicated areas that were specifically for them, markets for them in China. Uh, you would have Russia carving up their own area, England, France, uh, and the Japanese, and Germany. Now, England didn't really like how this was going. So they're going to do the same thing that they did with the Monroe Doctrine to us. They approached our Secretary of State, John Hay, and said, hello. I was going to say, hey, hey. <laughs> I was say, uh, hey, um, we don't like what's going on in China. Maybe you, as an unattached neutral party, should go in and say, you know, everybody should have an equal stance in China. Shouldn't carve up markets, but everybody should have the same stance. So Hay says, okay, that sounds good. So he issues in 1899 what is known as the Open Door Policy, in which he says that the United States is interested in securing free trade in China for everyone. To which England says, hey, that's great. Chip, 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 yeah, I like it. Good. And there you go. Okay? And then Germany says, eh. and Russia says, nah. and Japan says, no, I don't like it. And France says, no, I don't like it. But Hay says, okay, it's, it's fine and it's good. We're good, we're good. It's approved by everybody. Everybody likes it. Now, well, obviously not everybody liked it, but guess what? What are any of those people going to do about it when England says, yeah, we like this? They're not going to do anything. 
because the United States is modernizing their Navy. England has the biggest Navy, and so nobody's going to do anything with it. They're not going to run the risk of, of angering them. So the open door policy is announced to be binding on everyone. Free trade everyone. Then, in 1900, a group of nationalists, known of Chinese nationalists, known as the Boxers, are going to uh, rebel against the colonies and the colonial masters uh, of China. They're going to take over Peking, which is modern day Beijing, and they are going to uh, start eradicating any form of Western influence that they see. Missionaries are killed. Western missionaries are killed. You have um, anything that is seen to be Western is destroyed. People who dress Western, like, you know, suits and ties, are killed. And this goes on for 55 days. Eventually, the United States, England, Russia, Japan, and France are going to send in a 25,000 multinational force to put down this rebellion in China. It is later revealed to show that the Empress Dowager is behind this Boxer Rebellion. Now, once we have these forces in place, multinational force, mind you, and the Boxer Rebellion is put down, the other nations start saying, hey, we're here, let's just start carving up China. And the open door policy, now we didn't agree to it anyway. We're here, what are they going to do about it? To which John Hay is going to say, Hey, what do you say? Uh, says, no, the United States and Great Britain are still interested and will enforce this policy of territorial integrity. China will not be divided up. China is forced for this attack against Western influences in the colonies. It's forced to pay the equivalent of $10 billion in silver in modern money as an indemnity. They go, We're sorry, we did this in $10 billion. Eventually, it's going to be cut in two-thirds, and then the United States is going to worry about it, and we actually give back to China what they uh, had already paid us, almost like 1924. Eventually, what happens is the Dowager Empress uh, loses control of the government, and, uh, they, and, and China is created as a, uh, uh, China creates a republic. Okay. 1900, McKinley's elected to a second term. What's going to happen? What do you know? You know what's going to happen. He's going to be killed. While attending a Pan-American conference, which was a, a, in Washington, D.C., it was an a, uh, organization of all the American nations trying to work out you know, all sorts of diplomatic issues. William McKinley is... Um, Shaking hands with bystanders. You know, hey, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Comes across this one guy, and he's got uh, a bandage on his hand. He's like, oh, what happened? He's, he's just, bang, bang, bang! Oh, and he's shot. Oh. Inside the bandaged hand is a 38 revolver. Again, two of the bullets hit him. One breaks off, snaps off a button that must have been pretty tough button, and ricochets, and the other one goes into, into, into his chest, and he's going to die soon afterwards. The man who kills him is uh, a Marxist, his name is Leon Chalgosh, and he believed, when asked, why did you kill him? He said, it is wrong for one man to have so much, when so many have so little. And that's the whole reason for killing the president. Now, as soon as Mark Hanna, remember the Republican boss, hears that McKinley has been killed, or is, is dying, he's beside himself. He says, damn it, now that fool cowboy is president. So they took him out of New York City, New York, to put him in a place where he couldn't bother anybody, and what happened? Now he's president. Theodore Roosevelt is the youngest president ever. Theodore Roosevelt is the youngest president ever. What? 41. 41. Who's the 
youngest president ever elected? Say, okay, 43. The youngest president ever is Theodore Roosevelt. So, I've kind of touched on these things that he did. He was a civil service reformer, he was a rough writer, and he was governor of New York. All these things have propelled him further up. And now he has the highest position in the world. First thing he's going to turn his attention to is dealing with a major problem that showed itself during the Spanish American War. In the Spanish American War, the United States battleship Morgan was in San Francisco. She is ordered to proceed to Cuba as fast as possible. She goes to Cuba because it's shorter a distance than the Philippines. So she takes off. Hey, we're here in Cuba. Awesome, war's over. Oh, let's take it. And back to San Francisco. So it becomes apparent that there needs to be some way that we can get a fleet in the Pacific to the Atlantic a lot closer. Now, I know somebody's going to say, well, why did they just go to the Panama Canal? Well, the Panama Canal is not God's, in God's creation. It was man-made. I had a student once tell me, he said, you know, if, you know how, how much things would have changed if in 1492 Columbus would have just gone through the Panama Canal? You know, why did he just do that? Well, hmm, I don't know. So what happens is we need to figure out a way to get a fleet from this ocean to this ocean and the war not be over. So this requires us to go back in time a little bit to 1850. And in 1850, England and Great, uh, England and Great, Britain, Great Britain and the United States had signed a treaty called the clayton Bulwer Treaty that said that the United States and uh, England would not build a pan of build, excuse me, an Isthmian canal, canal along the Isthmus, uh, without the other one being involved. Okay, would not do that. Then in 1901, John Hay is going to be sent to uh, England to meet with uh, the, the British Foreign Minister, Lord Ponsipoff, and he would negotiate a new treaty. This treaty would abrogate the clayton Bulwer Treaty, which said that we had to do it together. What this says now, the hay Ponsipoff Treaty, is that uh, the United States, when we build the Panama Canal, we build a canal, I should say, Panama is it decided, it would be free to everyone. It would be open to all. We're not going to say, not for you, not for you, not for you. It's going to be open for all. So, England's cool with that. As long as it's open for all, we guarantee that it's going to be available. But there's a major problem in this area. And the major problem is that it is rife with yellow fever and malaria. You have swamps, you have lowlands, and up until the Spanish-American War, we really hadn't figured out a way to deal with these. However, after, um, after the Spanish-American War, when we are in Cuba, we discover what causes yellow fever, or actually what spreads yellow fever, and we know it today as mosquitoes. So if you eradicate mosquitoes, you will eradicate yellow fever. So what happens is because of yellow fever and malaria being eradicated, we are now in 1900 able to pursue this goal of building a uh, canal between the two uh, oceans. It comes down to two locations. One is in Panama, which is a uh, possession of Colombia, and the other is in Nicaragua. Um, Nic the, the Nicaragua path is a little bit less distance, um, but it's more mountainous, and in true government style, um, people are going to not like this. Not going to like Nicaragua, they're going to want Panama. And what happens is the people who want uh, Panama point out that in Nicaragua they have a stamp. And this stamp 
in very prominent fashion. They have a volcano, a live volcano, being portrayed. It's a vol very volcanic area. And to build a, pan build a canal in which you have volcanoes erupting all the time may not be a good idea. Eventually, it is going to be decided that they need to look somewhere else. Uh, we don't have time to go to where we're going to look. Uh, you guys got to get over to the, uh, the street. But that's where we're in for the day.